evening, and I'm so happy to be with you tonight and in chapter 13 of the book of Revelation. Chapter 13 of the book of Revelation is connected to chapter 12. And y'all remember what happened in chapter 12, don't you? The symbol there was that Satan swept away one-third of his angels and swept them down here to earth, and they are the spiritual forces of evil that have been in, in place uh, for a long, long time, and they're trying to wreak as much havoc as they can in the lives of God's people. Now, God's people will always have problems in their lives. Did you hear me? God's people will always have problems in their lives as long as they are on this side of glory. Just to check and make sure, how many of y'all have experienced some kind of problem in the last 12 months? Okay, we're 100% on that one. It's going to happen. They're going to be there. They're by God's design. And think about this this way. If you never had trials and tribulations, would you ever cry out to God? And in our humanity, the answer to that question is absolutely not. So God allows Satan to be able to mess with folks. And uh, he has to go through God to get to us. But sometimes he will even allow uh, Satan to, to take our lives for the greater good of us and uh, God's glory. But it's all in God's scheme, and it has to do with how many days we might live. We're going to look at chapter 13 tonight. We're going to talk about some stuff. I want you to understand that chapter 13, a lot of preachers will tell you that chapter 13 is something that happens in the future. But I want you to know that chapter 13 and what happens in chapter 13 has been going on ever since John wrote this down. And it will go on and continue to go on until God speaks and casts Satan into the lake of fire along with his uh, angels that he swept away with him. And there's purpose in all of that. So keep that in mind. But this is really where I want you to walk away from tonight is my summary statement that I have right here. Followers of Jesus wrestle with the powers of Satan daily and by God's Holy Spirit we are empowered with faith and we are empowered with perseverance. And there is nothing that can shake our faith and there's nothing that can persevere over us without at first having gone through God. Now we'll be at chapter 13 and we're going to read all the chapter 13 in just a minute. But let me, let me set it up and say a few things in advance. I want to start this message by reminding you that what is spoken in the book of Revelation is not a story. It is, it is the way it is. It is the reality. I know a lot of times when I hear the word story, I think about what I told my kids growing up. If I gave them a story, if I read them a story, it was usually a fictional story. Well, this is not a fictional story right here. It is everything that you read in it is not absolutely literal when it talks about uh, lambs and it talks about these things. These are not the lamb that you would think of out in the field but it is talking about a literal lamb. And in this case tonight, it's not probably going to be talking about Jesus. Well, it's going to be talking about Jesus sometimes when it says the lamb. And sometimes when it says the lamb, it's going to be talking about one of the beasts that are contained in the scriptures here. But these are symbols of things so that we can understand this. We live in the physical realm, and that is very real to us because we can see and we experience it every single day. But we also know that there is a spiritual realm that is every bit as real as the physical realm that we see from day to day. Sometimes we'll see where the physical in this world is actually the evidence of the unseen reality. Now, chapter 13 is, like I said a few minutes ago, a continuation to chapter 12. Remember earlier the sign, how the drag, how, how Satan came and it swept away one-third of those angels. Now, Satan desires to be worshipped. So would everybody say that Satan desires to be worshipped? Satan desires to be worshipped. And he'll do whatever he can to be worshipped by whomever he can get to worship him. Now, Satan desires to be worshipped, and he will, in order to do that, he will imitate God. And one of the ways he imitates God, we see in chapter 13. One of the ways he imitates God is through having his own unholy trinity. You've heard us talk about, as believers, we talk about the holy trinity, right? Well, he's got an unholy trinity that we'll try to unlock and look at that tonight. And those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, 
If you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. So if your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, you will not be deceived by Satan in this world when it comes to worshiping him. But those whose names are not written in there will absolutely be deceived and worship Satan probably without them even knowing that's who they're worshiping. As believers and followers of Jesus, we must be aware of Satan's ways so that we can hold firmly to our faith as we persevere through life. Now remembering, this will help, remembering that you are a foreigner here in this world. Remember, this world is not our home. We're just a passing through. Our, our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. You know, your, your real home is in heaven. And you will live eternity, live eternally there, and everything will be as it should be when you get there. But until you get there, many things will not be as they should be. And you're experiencing that now. Until that, that, that comes, you are at war and you are wrestling with the beasts that are talked about in chapter 12. So having said that, let's look at some of the symbolism of the reality of the spiritual realm that is all around us. So let's read chapter 13. And John says, And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, with ten horns and with seven heads and ten diadems, and its horns and, its, and, and blasphemous names on its head. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear. By the way, will a leopard tear you up? Will a bear eat you up? Okay, see, see some of the symbols? And its mouth was like that of a lion, which will chew you up. And to, to it, the dragon has given power, and to it, the dragon gave his power and his throne and his and great authority. All right? On one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled at, at, as they fo followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon. Now, let's think about who the dragon is right here. Does anybody want to take a shot at who the dragon might be? Satan. It's Satan himself, okay? And they worshipped the dragon. And he had given his authority to the beast. Now, it's important to understand it, that authority has been given to the beast by the dragon. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against him? There's the champion. In verse 5, And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words. And it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. And he opened his mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, that is those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints. And then what does your Bible say is next? And to conquer them. Okay. You don't like that being in there, do you? All right. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation and all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Does your say him? No, it says it. You know, uh, the Bible never refers to the Holy Spirit as a it. It always refers to him as a him. But yet here it says a it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. And if anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword, sword he will be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. So we got to have endurance and we got to have faith and those two things are going to help us out. Verse 11. Then I saw another beast. So we had one beast, now we got a second beast. And this beast was rising up out of the earth. 
and it had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast in its presence and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performed great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to the earth in front of the people, and by the sign that it and by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give birth to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak mighty curse uh, and speak and might curse those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it caused all it, it cursed all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand of the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark that it that is the name of the beast or the number of his name now this calls for wisdom let the one who has understanding calculate the number of beast for it is the number of man and his number is 666 six, six. Now let me let, let, let me remind you about those numbers things. We talk a lot about numbers in Scripture, and we talk about three represents like the Holy Spirit. We talk about twelve; it represents the government because that's how many. Oh, in the Old Testament there were twelve rulers. In the New Testament, according to Revelation, there's twelve rulers and all these kind of things. And we get to the number six. Uh, we talk about the number seven. It was perfection because on the seventh day God rested because of He created everything. It was perfect and it was good. But what did God create on the sixth day? He created a man, and he put him in the Garden of Eden. So the six represents humanity. And then in, in the Hebrew language, you have holy, then you have holy, holy. So holy is more than holy. But if you have holy, 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 holy is the holiest, and there's not any more than that. So six, six, six means the totality of the human being, of who that person is. And, of course, all God's people said. Let's chew on this a little bit and see if we can make some sense because this is a really difficult passage to be able to get a hold of. Let's start off by saying I want to talk about who the beasts are, the two beasts that we have here. The beast is of the dragon. So the beast come out from the dragon. Now, we determined who the dragon was. The dragon is Satan. Now, the purpose of the text, and you might want to write this down in your text so you don't get tripped up on this. The purpose of the text is not to reveal to you who the beast is. It doesn't sit there so you can figure out that uh, uh, any particular, that the Pope is the beast, that you, can, you can't come up with all these other names and put those in there. It never has intended to tell you this is who the particular beast is. But it is there to let followers of Jesus know that Satan wants to deceive people into worshiping him. So the best way he can deceive people into worshiping him is to mimic God. You remember in 1 Corinthians it says Satan uh, uh, masquerades as an angel of light. Now who is the light of the world? Jesus Christ is. So Satan is going to try to emulate everything that Jesus does only in the way that he thinks it ought to be done and try to make that look like it is, it is actually God himself and that he is actually God himself. Now the dragon is Satan. The first beast of the sea, I want you to think of it this way, is the world order. Everything that goes on in this world, well, let me ask you a question. You know the answer to this question. Who is the prince of this world? Satan is the prince of this world. According to Scripture, we can go back to the New Testament, we can pull that out. 
So all of the evil that goes on into this world is not from the kingdom of God, but it's from the kingdom of this world of which Satan is the king over the world, which is why Satan, when he tempted Jesus, he said, if you will follow me, I will give this world to you. Okay? But the, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, but my kingdom is out of this world. Okay? Remember, he tells Pilate all that. You remember, we've been talking about that. So the, the first beast is the world order that keeps everything going. Um, and that's the reason you'll say a lot of people will say, well, it's like the, uh, the uh, um, what are those? Oh, I lost the name of what I'm looking for. I don't have it written in my notes right here, but... Uh, the UN, the United States, the Union, United, United Nations. Thank you. I knew if I just waited long enough, I would hear it, and I did hear it. Okay, all right. So that that's, is that. Some people would say, "Well, that's it." Well, I, I want to stop short. I, I'm not going to deny that, but I want to say that this world order is being ruled by Satan himself, and it is considered to be the first beast that we see coming up out of the sea. And then the second beast that comes up out of the earth is the humans that come along in here. You might want to call them Antichrist. So everybody go ahead and say it, Antichrist, you know. And everybody wants to figure out who the Antichrist is. But I, I want you to caution you from doing that. There may well be one Antichrist at the last of the, of the, of the kingdom of this world. But what the Antichrist is is somebody who is anti-Christ, okay? How many people on the face of this earth right now are anti-Christ? Way more than there are believers, okay? Believers are not anti-Christ, they're pro-Christ. The anti-Christ is anti-Christ. So when we have human beings who rise up in the world that take great power, they become antichrist. Somebody might want to tell you that, that Hitler was an antichrist. Well, I'm not going to say he is the antichrist, but I'll agree that he is antichrist in, in the, in the, by, the, by looking at the things that he did in his life. So we have these humans that rise up at different times in different places to do the things that we do. The beast of the earth is, is human, and they are Satan. They are the, they'll put him in position so that it can be over the rulers of the kingdoms of this world. These beasts are not just at the end. They were functioning in the days of John, and they are functioning now, and they will function in the future until Jesus Christ comes back and destroys all evil. Beasts exist for a reason, and it's to force people into worshiping Satan. Because after all, that's what he wants. If you go back and you look in Ezekiel and you look in uh, uh, Isaiah, you find two times where it talks about the king of Tyre, and it talks about the beauty of Tyre, King Tyre, when he was created. It's actually a type of Satan, so that we know Satan thinks of himself the most beautiful being that has ever existed. Not the most beautiful being that's ever existed, including God and Jesus, but he thinks he's the most beautiful being that there ever was, and he is always trying to steal everybody's affection away from God because he believes he is the all in all. He does not have the power that God does, and he only has the power that God grants him, and God will call that power back from him on the day that he chooses to, but he believes that he'll be able to overpower God even at that time. Now, Satan desires this worship. Satan has always had a problem with pride. It is what caused him to fall from the presence of God, and he knows it is, he knows it is what will keep humans from God if he can just get people to have pride either within themselves and to think they don't even need God. So he has people on this earth who actually worship themselves. Let me ask this question. Have you ever known somebody that you thought actually thought they were God? Yes. You know, if you don't believe that there is a God and you do whatever you want to, you actually believe without understanding that's what you that you have taken God's place and you get to tell yourself anything you want and you get to do whatever you want to do. You take yourself and put yourself in the position of God 
and you are so prideful that you think you can do whatever you want to whenever you want to. Have you ever known anybody that falls in that category? We absolutely do. The beasts are not uh, just from the end. They're, they're here now. Now, he sweeps away these, and he comes and he brings them down here to earth. Now, Satan goes, and I, I want to spend a little bit of time on this. Satan goes to great lengths to make himself appear to be God. In fact, he imitates God in several ways. Um, like I said a while ago, he masquerades around as an as a angel of light, but I think the best way he tries to imitate himself as being God, he's come up with the unholy, what I call the unholy or the ungodly trinity. We're all familiar with the trinity, which is made up of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're totally inseparable. Now, his, Satan's trinity can't be inseparable, but he does have three powers that are at work here. Here in chapter 13, we see that Satan has this ungodly trinity, and it is his attempt to look like God. So Satan counterfeits the Trinity, and it's the dragon, it's, the, it's Satan who begets the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth, whoever those individuals may be at whatever given time in history. In Satan's attempt to be like God, Satan gives his, his beast that which is similar to what Jesus Christ did. Do you remember what Jesus said when he left earth and went back to heaven. Does anybody remember what the last thing Jesus said was? He said, uh, the angel said he's going to return in the same way. But Jesus spoke just before that. Does anybody remember what he said just before the angel said he'll return the same way? Okay, all right. If you go back, now Mitch, is, Mitch has got it right here. But right, right here he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And then he also says this, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And when you read the New Testament, you understand that there comes a time when, when Jesus brings everything into the perfect order that it's supposed to be, and he turns around and he gives the kingdom back to his Father. We actually are going to see that later on in Revelation. So what happens is, Say God gave Jesus authority to do everything he needed to do on earth because God knew that Jesus would never speak a word and he would never do a deed that the Father didn't want him to do. After all, the Father and the Son are one and the same, so they have perfect communication in there. So listen to the beast right here, chapter 11, verse 13. First thing I want you to see is the beast is given power and the beast is given authority. If you look, I think I'm going to put it on the screen right here. Verse 13 said this, And to it, talking about the beast, the dragon, who is Satan, gave his power and his throne, and gave him his power and his throne and great authority. So just like God placed this authority upon Jesus, Satan at this time is placing that authority upon the, the beast, which is the kingdom of this world that is here, who has that authority. Here's another thing that looks just like the Trinity. The beast speaks with absolute authority. Now, if you look down, if you look in your Bibles in Revelation 13, listen. And if Revelation 13, 4 says, And they worship the dragon. And who is the dragon? Satan. For he had given his authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against him? So the beast has been given this authority now that he can take out and he can use in any way, but he speaks, and when he speaks, if you keep watching the scripture, you'll find out that he blasphemes. So what is blasphemy? Well, blasphemy is, you know, we, we narrow that down in the Baptist circles. Like, well, that's rejection of the Holy Spirit, which will keep you from getting saved if you reject the Holy Spirit till you die. But blasphemy is much more than that. Blasphemy is when you credit this world and all the things that take place in this world to something other than God who is the creator. It's whenever you start saying that, no, that wasn't God that did that. This was you that did, did this. This was me that did this particular thing. So that is to actually blaspheme God when you take God out of the picture and you place yourself into the place where he is at. So that 
uh, uh, the, the beast is speaking with authority. You remember when Jesus was here? He's, the beast has the authority to speak on Satan's behalf to try to mess you up, to mess you up in any way that he can. You remember when Jesus was on the face of the earth, you look in the book of Mark, like many of us have studied through in, in, uh, in uh, Sunday school the last few months, and then you read through Luke and you read through Matthew, you'll find that quite often people will say this statement, when Jesus spoke, he spoke with authority. Because when he spoke, he was speaking the words of God. Well, now the beast, this world order that now speaks, speaks with the authority of Satan in mind. Would, you, would it be a far stretch to believe that the kingdom of this world is trying to pull people as far away from God as they possibly can? That's not a far stretch. It's actually, that's what its purpose is, to try to pull all of these people away from God. So that's two things he looks like to the Trinity. And here's a third one he looks like the Trinity. In it. The length of the beast's ministry is an amazing thing when it puts it in Scripture. It's three and a half years. It says in verse 13, verse 5, he says, the authority for 42 months. Now, how, many, how long is 42 months? It's three and a half years. Now, let me ask you this question. How long was Jesus carrying out his ministry on the face of the earth? Three and a half years he carried his ministry out until the day he was crucified and rose to go way back at the right hand of the Father. Here's another way that he tries to look like, the, to mimic the Trinity. The beast is given signs and wonders or miracles. Now, how many miracles did Jesus do while he was here? We, we can't count. In fact, what was it, the book of John that said if all the things that Jesus did were contained in the book, that all the books in the world wouldn't be able to hold all the things that Jesus did, all the signs and wonders and miracles. But look at, look at Revelation 13, 13 right here. It says, it, it talks about the beast. It said it performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to the earth in front of people. So he's trying to make, he's, the, the devil is trying to make them look just like Jesus Christ looks. The beast, it, it even says that the beast was a lamb. Looking over in Revelation 13, 11, it, it's described that way. He says, then I saw another beast, talking about the second beast who comes up out of the earth, and it had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. So just like Jesus Christ is referred to the Lamb and was when he spoke about in chapter 13 about the Lamb's book of life, Jesus' book, here Satan's trying to make his offspring that he's got now look like a lamb that's come away. Of course, that lamb is not going to be sacrificed for our sins. That's, that's, that lamb is here to bring you into sin, not pull you away, not take your punishment for it, but to cause you to sin more. And then here's a sixth one, and there's more than this. The beast is actually able to give life. Now, when Jesus was here three times, we saw him raise people. from Jairus' daughter, he goes over and lay hands on Jairus and speaks, and she stands up. He walks past the widow of Nun, and she's walking by, and Jesus reaches up and touches the coffin, and what happens to the man in the coffin? Comes right back to life right there. And Jesus hears that Lazarus is sick and dying, and he says he'll, he'll do well if he'll just let him sleep. But then three days later, four days later, he shows up, and, and the Scripture says, that, you know, the guys tell him, well, don't, you know, we can't raise Lazarus. He's, he's been decomposing. His body already stinks. But Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth out of the grave. And what happens? He rises him up from the grave. But I'm here to tell you, if you look back at the text we just read, one of the beasts is going to have a mortal wound. Now, what does mortal wound mean? It's going to be one of them that's going to bring them to death. It's a wound that's going to kill you. But yet the other beast is going to turn around and raise him up from the dead. You see the symbolism that we got here? Just like God reached down and raised Jesus Christ up from the dead, the beast that's been created by Satan, the dragon, is going to re-raise the other one up in there. So there's, there's purpose behind all of these statements. Satan seals his servants. Now, he won't, he, just like God has a seal on us with the power of the Holy Spirit, Satan has a seal with him, and it is the seal with the mark of man like God seals his servants with the seal of the Holy Spirit. Now, remember, every symbol in the book of Revelation is either a literal thing 
or it's a symbol of a literal thing. When it says in Revelation that the, the number of the beast that was put on the forehead of the people was 666, I know a lot of preachers have told you for years that you're going to have a tattoo or something put on your forehead that says 666 and you can't get food unless you uh, can bow down to the beast. Well, I don't really think that's the way it works. Because the mark is on the forehead, I think, it's the, I think the symbolism here is deeper than just the mark on the outside. By the way, can you make yourself look one way on the outside and actually be another way on the inside? We as Christians do it all the time. We try to let people think that we're awesome on the outside, but on the inside we know we sin and fall short of God's glory. Well, God's smart enough to see through the mark, okay? So I think what the Scripture's talking about is those who yield to the world order are going to be marked by the world. Now, that'll, that'll work. you got a computer. You, can, you know, we all have Social Security numbers. Does that mean that we bow down to the beast? Well, no, that doesn't mean we bow down to the beast. It just means when we were born, they gave us a Social Security number. But if the beast wanted to use that in his system, he could have a, a comfortable way to get there with us. How does that work? It's, how does that practically work its way out? Well, when your mind is convinced that the government will take care of you, and you got to do whatever you got to do to bow down to the government, you are not a follower of Jesus Christ. Or, at least, or if you are, at least you're in rebellion against God. I've had, earlier in my ministry, I had a lot of times where people, for instance, they wouldn't get married because if they got married, they would lose uh, tax exemptions, they would lose health care in certain situations, and it was not fi financially beneficial for them to get married. But they would do that in the name of the government because one might be collecting a government check. Many of, them, many of the ladies in this situation would have a couple of kids or something to be collecting a welfare check. But if she married this man over here that made you know, $50,000 a year, then she would no longer collect a welfare check over here. So my question becomes to that particular group of people there is who do you trust in? Do you trust in the word of God that God has given you and told you this is what you're supposed to do? Or do you trust in the government who's writing you a check? Now, you say, well, preacher, that's meddling. Well, no, it's just the truth. It's just the way the thing is. you you got to make a decision. Is my allegiance to the world order or is my allegiance to God? Now, just because you're caught in that situation doesn't mean you're lost. But what it does mean is you got to sit and focus on this thing and think about this for a while. You know, uh, we, our trust has got to be in Jesus Christ in every area of our lives. When you go to the doctor and you got cancer and you're going to die, do you want a good doctor? You absolutely do. You want the best you can get. And you go to that doctor and you find out if he says there's hope and if he thinks there is and you can do this and you pray through it and you go and you have that surgery. When you pray, you pray for the doctor. You pray that his hands will be skilled and he'll do everything he's supposed to do. And you pray that the medication that goes in your body does what it's supposed to do. But are you trusting in the doctor or are you trusting in God? Okay, that's where the rubber hits the road. If your brain thinks humanity to the fullest, 666, then you're showing that you're an unbeliever. But if you're trusting in Almighty God, to manipulate and use the humanity of this world for God's glory and your good, then you're actually trusting in God, which is revealing to you that you're actually a born-again believer of Jesus Christ. You see how that works together and comes together? That's what these scriptures are helping teach us right here in the middle of this. All of these, uh, all of these uh, imitations that Satan has exist so that Satan can deceive those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But since their heads are not marked with 666, but their heads are marked with the Holy Spirit, who says you are a child of God, after you wrestle with stuff in this world for a little while, you always wind up doing what God wants you to do. The seal of the Holy Spirit will always pull you to God. Here, here's a reality. The Holy Spirit through your whole life is going to always be revealing new sinfulness in you. 
when you get saved, you don't know all that's in there. You just know you've been saved. As you travel on, well, you'll find out this is a sin, that's a sin. Some sins you'll say, okay, I'm never going to do that again. Uh, for me, alcohol was a sin, so there was a point in time where God convicted me of that, and I put a beer down, and I never ever drank another beer after that, and really did well with that, and never had a problem with that. And then God revealed to me that eating, when you ate for uh, too much, and you put, got all your strength and confidence in eating, uh, and I prayed that God would remove my desire for food away. And you know what? God has never removed my desire for food away. I could easily give up the alcohol, but I can't so easily give up the food. So why didn't God just remove that from me so I'd never deal with that? And I could be six foot three and skinny like all the good looking men, you know? But it doesn't work that way. God leaves that stuff in here so that there's tension in your life so that you'll fall out before him and you'll struggle through the stuff that you struggle through all the rest of your life. That's why you need him so much. But when you belong to the Holy Spirit, you wrestle with those sins for ages and days and months and, and times. Some is cast away and you never worry about it again. Some you deal with it all the days of your life. But Satan, he'll come in and he'll start messing with your head. He'll try to say, well, if you were really a believer, you wouldn't be fat. If you were really a believer, you could, you could just stop eating right now in a situation. <laughs> And then we have to wrestle with that in our head. If you're lost, you'll come to the conclusion, well, I mean, yeah, if you're lost, you say, well, he's right. You know, I just, I, I, I can't, you know, I'm just going to give up this Christianity thing. I may as well just live for today and worry, don't worry about tomorrow. I'm not going to take care of myself for the rest of my life. But if you actually have the Holy Spirit that's marked in your mind and your heart, that's been deposited in you, you're going to continue to wrestle with it and some days you're going to win, and some days you're going to lose, but you're going to make it to the end because you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Satan deceives people into thinking that they need the things of this world to survive. You know, I've heard a lot of people say that they know that God provides all their needs, but... The problem is, is they and God don't see the needs are the same thing. Have you ever felt like that? Well, God, I need this, and you didn't give it to me. Well, maybe God knows you didn't need it, you know? So it, Satan knows that, and he tries to mess with that. He has, mar he has marked the thinking of this world to be in the direction of this. Now, deception, now I want, I want this, deception is a slippery slope. Whenever you can walk away, and the Holy Spirit is not there to pull you back to where you need to be, the, you will wind up blaspheming just like the Holy Spirit does. The beast will give, was given a mouth to utter haughty and blasphemous words. Blasphemy is speaking evil about God. It's slandering the name of Jesus. And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for three and a half years. Satan will increase pressure on people so that they will deny God to obtain the mark of this world, the mark of humanity, so they can look and find what will fill that empty hole. You know, God created every person with an empty hole inside of them that only Jesus Christ can fill, but the people who are led by this world follow drugs, they follow alcohol, they follow sexual addiction, they follow all kinds of things to try to satisfy that. The, uh, the, Satan will increase pressure on people so that they will deny God and obtain a mark of the beast. That is why they will trust the government and not God for their daily provision. We see that each day a person, we see, we see this each day as people turn to the beast of this world for their daily needs instead of turning to Jesus Christ. We hear them say things like, how could a loving God let this take place? Or, or the government needs to provide for us or to care for us. Satan blinds the eyes of his followers so that they never are able to see the lamb for who he is, which is the one who came to take away our sins and, and, and take the beating that we should have received on Calvary. So let's talk about wrestling with the beast for a little bit right here. Believers are admonished to persevere with faith even to the point of death. How many of you in here today believe that people 
have been persecuted unto death on the face of this earth. Now, sometimes your mind will start going, well, God, why didn't you stop that? Why didn't you keep that from happening? God, why did you let the Nazis come in and put the millions of Jews to death back during World War II like they did? God, why didn't you say that? Satan's going to use that to try to prove to you that there is no God. But yet, we come to the realization that God is absolutely sovereign. Now, let me ask, let me ask you a couple of series of questions here. Is it better to be in heaven or is it better to be down here? Everything is perfect in heaven, and everything in the world is messed up. Now, Paul says he's torn. It's better, it's far better for me to be away from the body and present with the Lord. But he says to the church at Philippi, it's better for you, for me, to be here so I can have fruitful work while I'm here. See, God doesn't just zap us out. He leaves us here because there's fruitful work we're supposed to be doing. And as we do that fruitful work, we're going to struggle. But our faith is going to strengthen. As you study the Word of God, you come to the conclusion that you don't have faith because you believe enough and you mustered up that belief yourself. You come to the conclusion that God gave you the faith that you need to have. So you quit trusting in your own faith and you trust in God for your faith. And when He shakes your world upside down, you trust in him, and you break out on the other side. I was thinking about Job when I was thinking about this message a little while back, and I thought, you know, Job had it all. He had, a, he had uh, kids that, were, that followed God. He had camels. I mean, everything he could have during that time period he had. But then Satan comes up to God because he wants to mess with somebody, and uh, he said, I've been looking for somebody, and it's God. He says, hey, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And he says, you can touch Job, you can do anything you want to, just don't touch his body. So Job loses everything except for his wife, and, his, and, and, and he loses it all. But he still understands that God is sovereign, that God gets to do whatever he wants to do, and he still says God is God. Just give me an appointment with God. I'd like to explain why this ain't fair, but, but, but he never denies God. And then Satan comes back and, and says, yeah, but the only reason he hadn't done that is because you didn't let me touch his body. He said, okay, Satan, you can do anything you want to to his body. You just can't kill him. So he makes Satan so sick with his body that it would have been better for Satan to be dead than be alive. So sick that Satan said, that, that, that Job said, I, wi- I cursed the day that I was ever born. And you say, why in the world would God do something like that? Because there are things we don't understand. There is a battle in the spiritual realm that we don't get. But God does. But let's go back to Job and think about it. In the end, how did it end for Job? God doubled everything that he had. God gave him his health, so he lived to be an old man in his hundreds. Job even gave him, for every child he lost, he gave him another child that he could play with, and he was was able to spend time with his children, his children, and his children's children. And then when he died, he died a a happy old man. You see, when he got to heaven, though, he had all the first children. And then sooner or later, all the second children came there to be with him. And all the first children escaped all the trials and tribulations of the world and never had to go through that stuff that Job had to go through. What a mighty God we serve. But they couldn't get that until the other end. Job's faith never faltered. His patience did. Your patience falters. My patience falters. We, we think we can see better ways that God ought to do things. But by His design, He's going to put us through all that. Some of us might even lose our lives, and some of us live to be old people. But God knows what He's doing. Um, that's the reason the scripture said if anyone is to be taken captive to captivity he goes if anyone is to be slain with the sword with the sword he will be slain he, here is a call for the endurance of faith of the faith, endurance and faith of the saints I don't know if God called me to die for his glory or to live for his glory 
but whatever, whichever place I'm at, I'm going to do for his glory. And that's the same thing you're going to do. He already knows, but we don't already know. Second, the second thing about this wrestling with the beast is you are currently in the battle of your life. Satan, the beast of this earth, and the beast of the sea, the world powers, and the people Satan has in places, and Satan are under Satan's authority, and they're doing everything that they can daily to deceive you by the gods of this world. Maybe it's the god of drugs. Maybe it's the god of possession. Maybe it's the god of power, sex, uh, pleasure, whatever it is. It is only by your faith that you're able to persevere. And people without faith will all fail. But those with true faith will endure to the end. Peter says it this way. Be sober-minded and watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. The seal of Satan is 666, is, is counterfeit, and it will not save you in the end, but the seal of God's Holy Spirit is real, and it will save you in eternity. By God's Spirit, believers are empowered to walk by faith as we live in a world full of landmines that have been planted by Satan and his army. Let, let God's Spirit in you guide you from day to day, and you will find that you will have the perseverance that is called for by God. He never calls us to something that he does not empower us to be able to do it. That's why we can all say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. If there's someone here today who has been deceived by the world, you need to know that God has brought you here so that you can understand that he loves you. And he loves you so much that he sent his one and only son to die on the cross so that you can have eternal life. So don't blaspheme God by rejecting him. But let Satan, don't let Satan deceive you and trick you into worshiping him. Rather, come to Jesus for salvation. Lord God in heaven,